So we're in the final message this morning of the series, uh, Back to the Basics. Uh, it was a summer series, and uh, we ended up having uh, a good number of special guests minister to us over the summer. And so it's moved into September a bit more than I planned, but I got started on this and I felt we really needed to finish it. So next Sunday morning, we begin our series through the Book of Romans. Uh, people have been asking me how long the Book of Romans series is going to be. Uh, the answer is I really don't have a clue. But Ephesians had six chapters, and Romans had 16, and Ephesians took me two and a half years, so uh, I think I may have a retirement plan here. <laughs> um, starting the book of Romans next Sunday morning. But this morning we conclude our final look at the foundations of our faith. And so for the sixth time, we're going to read these verses from Ephesians chapter 5. Why don't we stand together in reverence as we hear God's Word together this morning. Beginning at verse number 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he's an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. And then the writer to the Hebrews lists these six elementary principles. Number one, uh, repentance from dead works. Number two, faith toward God. Number three, instruction about washings or baptisms. Number four, laying on of hands. Last week we looked at number five, the resurrection of the dead. Now, last week I thought I preached on the resurrection of the dead. Afterwards, somebody came up to me and said, great way to start off kickoff Sunday preaching about hell. Um, I really thought I taught about the resurrection of the dead. But, uh, and number six, eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. And this we will do if God permits. I believe God has permitted us to teach this over the summer. And may his Holy Spirit come now. Holy Spirit, just come and give us hearts to hear everything you want us to learn today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We read this verse in Hebrews chapter 9. It is appointed for man to die once. And after this comes judgment. Every one of us has an appointment. You only get it once. Every one of us has an appointment with death. There are only two kinds of people around dead ones and live ones. Dead ones have been buried. Every one of us has an appointment with death. And after this, after this comes the judgment. After this comes judgment. Scripture teaches us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Many of us live as if we're never going to have to give account for anything, and we live unwise lives. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, understanding that the life we live down here we are going to have to give account for is an important part of living wisely. It was appointed unto man wants to die, and after that comes judgment. 
This is a foundational doctrine of the church. This is a foundational doctrine of the church. Some of you look mad at me already. I, I want to defend myself a little bit here. I didn't make this up. I'm reading you God's Word. This is what God says. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes judgment. Foundational conviction of the Christian church. First Corinthians, second Corinthians, sorry, chapter five and verse number ten. We must all, how many of you fit into that category? All. Six of you, good. The rest of you, I don't know where you belong, but we must six of us appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. All of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not just the six of you who think you're going to stand there. All of us. All of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The phrase judgment seat of Christ is uh, the phrase that describes the judgment of the believer in scriptures. Before you leave this morning, I'm going to talk about the judgment of the unbeliever, but we're starting by talking about the judgment of the believer. The judgment of the believer in scripture is referred to as the judgment seat of Christ. Romans says this, chapter 14 and verse 10. Why do you judge your brother? Why uh, do you regard your brother with contempt? We will, there's that nasty word again, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians here called the judgment seat of God. Normal theological discussion calls the judgment of the believer the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to stand before the Lord. And Paul's argument is why in the world are you being so hard on your brother for, or sister for the tiny little things they do? Don't you realize that there's a day ahead <laughs> when you are going to have to give account? Don't you realize that? As I age, I realize that I'm not spending all of my time, and, and I'm not a I'm not a negative, depressed, discouraged pastor this morning, but I, I'm not spending all my time thinking just about the things I wish I'd never done that I did do. I find myself disconcerted with the things I've never done that I should have done. We, we have a lot to think about when it comes to our relationship with life and the Lord. I don't think any of us, well, maybe there's a couple of you really nice ones, but I don't think most of us can afford to be hard on anybody. Why do you judge your brother? Why, 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 why do you regard your brother with contempt? We'll all stand, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So the challenge here is <laughs> realizing at the same time that Scripture is completely consistent and is always consistent 
And if you're ever studying Scripture and, and you run into some portions of Scripture that you say, oh, I don't like that, that doesn't fit into my theology, your theology's wrong. Your theology's wrong. And, and you can't erase that scripture and say, well, that was meant for really bad people or something, or the Mennonites. Um, you, you have to say, that's, that's for me, and I have to figure out how it fits. And so we're told that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of, of Christ. And then we also read verses like Hebrews chapter 10 and and verse 17, and their sins and their lawless deeds will I remember no more. What's with that? I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and yet God said he's never going to remember a single thing that I have done wrong, that is on the wrong side of the list. Never going to remember. What, what's going on here? You got to make this stuff fit. You got to make this stuff work. Because Scripture doesn't contradict itself. John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, so this is true, I say to you, he who hears my word, believes him who sent me, has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death. So if you have eternal life and you have heard his word and you believe him, you're not going to come into judgment, but what are you going to do? You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Are you confused yet? You're not going to be judged, but you are going to be judged. Hmm. That's a little bit weird. Romans 8, verse 1. Most of us find great peace in this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ, you're not going to be condemned. Yeah, that's real scripture, friends. That's as much scripture as when you were all looking mad at me when I told you you were going to die. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God, God's elect? God is the one who, who justifies. So God's going to look at you and he's going to look at you just as if I, just as if you'd never sinned, and yet you're going to be before the judgment seat of Christ. How does this compute? How does this work? How do you make sense out of this? Romans chapter 3 and, and verse number 6 asks a really interesting question. The end of the verse how will God judge the world? Well, how is God going to judge the world? So we're not going to be judged, but God says he's going to judge the world. How is God going to do that? Well, certainly the starting point in that is, as, as the writer to Romans, the Apostle Paul, says, is we need to realize, verse 10, that there's none righteous not one. None of us will be able to stand before God and say, I understand why you wouldn't let some of those other scumbags in, but me, I'm perfect. Did you know, Lord, did you understand that not even once in my life did I jaywalk? Not once. God, I, I got my stuff together. None of us are, none of us are righteous. How's God going to judge the world? Well, that's uh, the starting point. None of us are righteous. In verse number 20, same chapter, uh, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. None of us are going to be able to stand before God and say, uh, look at all the good stuff I did, and on the bad side of the ledger, Lord, there's nothing there. Uh, you, you noticed I never got a speeding ticket, didn't you, Jesus? <laughs> None of us are going to be able to make those kind of arguments before God. By the deeds of the law, none of us 
will be, uh, be justified in, in God's sight. Why? Verse number 23, same chapter. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how are we going to be judged? How's God going to judge the world? Well, here's the answer, verse number 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, that is going to be the huge question when you stand before the Lord. Have you been justified by uh, the free gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ our Lord? That's going to be the big question. So taking you back now to the foundations of our faith. Uh, where does it start? What's the first foundation of our faith? And friends, it's important for us to know this. This is stuff you were all supposed to have learned in, ele in the elementary years of our Christian growth. All of us should be able to articulate this. All of us should be able to sit down in any coffee shop in this city. If somebody asks you, what do you believe as a Christian? We should be able to go over these six points and explain them very, very well. This is stuff you learn in elementary school. So what's the first thing you learn as an elementary student in your faith? What's the first thing you got to do? Repentance from dead works. That's where it all starts. If you're going to live for Christ, if you're going to live for God, the first decision you have to do is say, I'm going to change the way I'm thinking about works, about dead works. I realize all of my works are dead, they're useless, they bring no life to them. I cannot do anything that is so big and so impressive that God feels like he owes me something. We change our thinking about all of that. And we realize our walk as Christians is not based on any goodness of our own. We have all sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, every single one of us here. But oh, the abyss of this glorious spot, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we repent of our, of our works. <laughs> it's not really sin we have to repent of. We're all, that, we're all in the same boat there. We have to repent of our thought that it's our works that can solve the sin problem. And then what do we put our faith towards? What's the second foundational fundamental thing we have to believe? As believers, now let me repeat myself. We all need to be able to articulate this. We all need to be able to understand this. We should be able at any coffee shop in the city, if somebody asks us, what do you believe? We should be able to go over these six things and explain them. This is what we believe as Christians. So what's the second thing we believe? We repent from our dead works and we put our faith towards God. So we're no longer relying upon our own works, our own abilities, our own niceness, but we have put entirely 100% without exception our faith towards God and the completed work of Jesus Christ through the cross and his triumphant resurrection. We wake up in the morning confident about our relationship with God, not because we were absolutely nice to absolutely everyone the day before. We are confident in our relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for us. We have put all of our faith towards him. So when we stand before God, as believers, uh, your, your eternal destination is not in question for a millisecond of a millisecond. Because you're not relying on yourself, your confidence is in somebody who's already completed the work of salvation for you. So then, then why even have this judgment seat? It's a given. Well, the Greek word for judgment seat is bema. 
And it's the word, and everybody Paul's writing to here would have been very familiar with it. It's the word that refers uh, to the ancient Greek Olympic, Olympics. It was the Bema seat that the chief executive officer of the Olympics sat on at the end of the Olympics and handed out the gold medals and the silver medals and the bronze medals. Well, actually, it wasn't medals back then, but that's what we understand. So the Bema seat is not so much a judgment seat as a reward seat. All of us are going to stand before the reward seat, the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. So what does Scripture say about that? 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now here is where it's really easy to develop unbalanced theology. Here is where it's really easy to develop unbalanced theology. And where we think, well, Jesus has done it all for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so I'm going to heaven no matter what. So it really doesn't matter at all what I do. <laughs> so I got Jesus in my heart, but I'm going to live like the devil. That's not how it works. We have to give account for how we live out our our faith. We do. <laughs> so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether, whether good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So your Christian life needs to be completely about Jesus. And if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so as through, through fire. What a picture is painted for us here. What a picture. All of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when we stand there, rewards are going to be handed out on uh, the basis, next slide please, on the basis of things done on earth, and number two, rewards will be lost as a result of things done on earth. So how many believers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? All of us. Now, I want you to comprehend that. That's not all the Christians in Saskatoon. That's not all the Christians in Saskatchewan. That's not all the Christians in North America. That's not all the Christians in the world. That's all the Christians. Christians from the first century, Christians from the second century, third century, fourth century, all the way up to the 21st century. All Christians are going to stand before, before Christ. Now, so picture this in your mind. It's a pretty big group. It goes 
on and 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 on. Not only that way, but that way and, and that way. It's huge. I don't know how God's going to do that. I don't know if he's going to do it a century at a time. If he's going to do it based on what church you attended, okay, neighborhood church, it's your turn. Uh, I don't know if he's going to do it in alphabetical order. I don't know if ladies are going first and then the man. I have no idea. Actually, I do have an idea, and I think it's right. You understand that God is is big and omnipotent and omniscient. And he can carry on a personal conversation with Brian and me and Tammy and Jolene at exactly the same time. I don't think it's going to take him eternity to deal with this. I think it's going to be pretty quick. But all of us are going to stand before God. It's going to be a personal moment. And uh, we're going to be, we're going to be, be judged. Jacqueline Schoenfeld's going to be judged, and I'm going to be judged. And for sake of illustration now, we're in a line. And God decides, I uh, go first, because he respects old people. And I'm standing before God at the judgment seat of Christ, and, and God is huge, and God is big, and God's before me, and, and I'm feeling not particularly huge. But I bring before God all my works, and, and I say, God, well, I had this stool, God, you know, and I would sit on the stool for the first couple of minutes of most of my sermons, Lord. I had a stool I presented to you, and, and Lord, I, I, I preached the word, and I had a bunch of little Bibles, and I kept breaking them so I didn't use them anymore, and God, I, I had a, a big Bible that I fairly big Bible that I, that I preach from, and, and I'm trying to impress with him with everything I've done. Lord, I've preached on five continents. Lord, I've even been a district superintendent. And God listens to me go on and on and on about how great I think I am. And after listening to my rather ridiculous presentation. He pulls out some kerosene from behind his throne. And he pours it on my pile of, of works. And then he grabs a match throws it on my pile of works and I look at it burn and when it's done there's nothing left there everything I did was wood and hay and stubble stuff Not a single thing has stood the test of fire. And then God calls Jacqueline up. And Jacqueline's sweet and Jacqueline's humble. She's a little broken before the Lord. 
She says, I really didn't do that much, Lord. Here's all I got. My pile was eight feet tall and hers is a foot and a half. God takes up the kerosene and he pours it over Jacqueline's pile and takes a match out. And he throws it on the pile and Jacqueline is waiting for it to burn because pastor's burnt. But nothing burns because it's gold and silver and precious metal stuff. And God says, Jacqueline, <laughs> here's all this stuff. Go put it on your mantle in your big mansion. And know I loved you and appreciated everything you've done. And she's rewarded for her works and me. I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. And I'm glad I'm there. But I'm a little embarrassed to have you over for tea. Because there's absolutely nothing on my mantle. How do we make sure, how do we make sure that, that while we're living down here, we're not living this in a way that's all wood, hay, and stubble stuff? Well, let me, let me give you a few suggestions. I know this is not an exhaustive list. I'd be a fool to pretend it is. But, but here's some stuff you need to do. Make sure you're doing what you do for God's glory. Make sure you're doing what you do for God's glory. Every once in a while, somebody decides to leave the church I'm pastoring. In all honesty, I get that. I understand that. Don't take that as permission to leave, but I get it. But I don't get it when they tell me the reason they leave is, Pastor, I'm out of there. Nobody's been noticing me. All the stuff I'm doing, nobody notices. I'm quitting. I'm out of here. You're doing stuff for Jesus to get noticed? Huh? Huh? Everything we do has to be for his glory. I'm not saying it's right for us not to notice you, but it's wrong for you to expect to be noticed. It's for his glory. It's for his glory. It's for his number two. Do it willingly and cheerfully. Middle of January, been snowing all night Saturday. You come to church Sunday, you're a good saint, you're the first person there. Snow is this deep at the front door. Going to the church after you've somehow figured out how to open the door six inches to squeeze through it. And you pick up the shovel and. <laughs> Thought we had a pastor around here. What do we pay him for, anyhow? You think God doesn't notice that? You think God doesn't notice that? 
Another guy shows up on the, on the east side of the church and he goes and gets a shovel. And he's, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. What's your attitude? Do what you do. Willingly and cheerfully with a good attitude. Number four, don't be hard on your brothers and sisters in Christ. We read this in Matthew, do not judge so that you'll not be judged. In the way you judge, you'll be judged. By your standard of measure, it'll be measured to you. <laughs> You know, one of the ways we're going to be give account for our lives is the attitude we've had towards others. And if you've been really, really hard, if you've been really, really hard on other people, not willing to forgive your wife for whatever, not willing to forgive that boss from six years ago, can't get over what the pastor said last Sunday about people going to hell, can't get over that stuff. And it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and you get meaner and meaner and meaner as you get older and older and older. You're just asking the measurement stick in your own life to be a really large one. If you can learn to be full of mercy and grace and kindness, mercy and grace and kindness gets applied to us. James chapter 2, verse 13. Judge, judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. I pray for us this morning, Father. I pray that in our marriages, I pray that in our relationships with each other, I pray that in our relationship at work, we will be marked as people of mercy. I pray we will be marked as merciful people in Jesus' name. And lastly, I, I got the, I added this one this week when I was reading through Romans for who knows what time. Don't be a stumbling block. Romans 14, this whole issue of, of making sure we're not being a stumbling block to others and the fact that we're going to have to give account for it. Friends, we live in community and we have a responsibility to others. We live in community and we have a responsibility uh, to others.